So as uh, Audrey told you, we had a lot of time to prepare for this, uh, which was yes to translate to yesterday. But we live in those kinds of times, so that's OK. So uh, the format's going to be a little different than what you would have normally seen from a closing keynote. Uh, we decided, in collaboration, which should be another theme, I think, moving forward, that we would each give sort of a starting statement. And then we're going to do a bit of a Q&A. And then hopefully we'll have time and we'll open up Q&A for you to come back to us. OK? Because two-way dialogue is another thing I think that we all agree is part of the future. So I guess I'll begin. Sure. So the angle that I chose to uh, start with from uh, a leadership standpoint, from a transitional standpoint, was just to speak a little bit about uh, leading in transitionary times. And I've had a little experience about that and continue to. So forgive the paper, but like I said, we didn't have a lot of time. Right, Audrey? Right. OK. So uh, I think we can all agree uh, more has changed than has stayed the same in the past 10 to 15 years. And I think a lot of discussion was had this morning around that. And I think we can also agree um, that so far, the change that we've had is nothing compared to what's ahead of us. And I find that exciting. I hope you do too. Um, as we know, technology has changed and will continue to change our lives and how we do business in exponential ways. The thing we know for sure is that we'll continue to live in a constant state of transition. So for me, I've had the pleasure of working um, mostly on the agency side for a good part of my career, which is where Audrey and I met many years ago. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working over those years with many different kinds of clients, leading teams and driving productive change in traditional times, in transitionary times, and traditional times as well. Um, a famous American futurist, I actually found this yesterday and I thought, this is so cool, I'm going to lead with this, uh, had this to say about transition. It's not so much that we are afraid of change or so in love with the old ways, but it's that place in between that we fear. And I think the last panel has brought up fear. Yeah. It's like being between two trapezes. It's Linus when his blanket is in the dryer, there is nothing to hold on to. <laughs> so I thought that kind of summed it up. And I have to agree that in transitional times, there's a lot less to hang on to, right? But I think that leaves our, our arms wide open so that it gives us the opportunity to create and play with things and sort of discover what might be possible. And that's a lot about what we talked about this morning. So in this world of what's possible, the canvas is wide open and it's for us to write the future with the right amount of vision and passion. In these transitional times, we can see what the impossible now becomes the new normal. And if you think about all the concepts we talked about this morning, none of that was possible a few years ago. So I find that really exciting, too. Um, today's leaders need to be comfortable navigating within a blank canvas. Someone talked about open spaces. So for me, that's a blank canvas or an open canvas. They need to be able to see the picture before it's fully formed. Today's leaders have to shape the canvas to the best of their ability with, with, while always keeping one eye out towards the horizon to try, try to see what might be coming, because we know things are coming fast. And they need to leave enough space on the canvas to incorporate things that are out there, knowing that these new things, these new possibilities, will make the canvas even richer. The horizon also may hold hints of the next canvas, and that's important too. So today's leader needs to have a clear vision, be focused, but always searching at the same time. So Ben from Google, if he was still here, he would appreciate that. <laughs> uh, today's leaders need to think creatively. We talked about that a lot in the last panel. They need to be open and they need to be passionate about storytelling and technology and have no problem learning and collaborating because that's what it's all about. Today's leaders need to be able to have enough passion for their whole team so when the team has a hard time or can't see where they're going, they hold on because they know that the leader has enough passion to take them all for the ride and they all know that they'll be better for it, including the leader. So I think these transitional times is sort of the best times to be in. I find them very exciting because we get to create, we get to learn, we get to drive productive change. And who doesn't want to do that, right? So with that, I'm going to let Meredith talk about leading a transitional company for change, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you, Nadine. I have to say um, that is the best use of Linus and the security budget <laughs> in a speech that, I, that I've heard. So, um, I'll say I'm in a you know, great moment of change. I'm, I'm nine months on the job as the head of advertising at the New York Times. And the New York Times 
Um, and I think every media company, and maybe particularly the New York Times, is in a, a great moment of change. And um, I was actually saying in the cab on the way over to my, my two colleagues that I still have that feeling every day, nine months in, when I work, walk into the Times, that I'm stepping into a place that's, that's hallowed and that the job as, as head of advertising at the Times, and I think the job across the whole Times, um, is, is nothing short of, and you'll forgive me what might sound like exaggeration, but it feels this way to me, nothing short of, of trying to, you know, find a sustainable model for the fourth leg of democracy, for high quality primary sourced reporting that the world needs to function in a civilized way. So um, it's a huge, huge privilege to be there. And I'll say that the first two pieces of advice that um, my boss, the CEO of the Times, who's also relatively new, he's about six months ahead of me on the job, gave to me um, were one, he said, the work is to come in and, and bring about change fast and dramatically, but to do so without creating antibodies to that change. And I thought that's, that's, um, that's as hard as it sounds. Um, <laughs> and the second thing he said was, that you know, the hardest thing in his experience about change had been figuring out all the things that you need to change and also what not to mess with. And I think a lot of what we do at the Times falls in, into that second bucket. So I'll say you know, the big kind of eye-opening moment of, of what the change was about at the Times came for me recently when somebody said to me, somebody who's a lover of the New York Times said to me, you know, if, if the New York Times were a solar system, the newspaper would be the sun and everything else would be the planets in orbit around it. And I was about to agree with him, and certainly in terms of revenue, newspaper is the biggest thing we still do. But I, I actually paused and I said, in fact, that's the, part of what's so great about change at the Times and what enables change is the notion that it's actually the journalism that's the sun and that the purpose that that journalism serves in the world and all of the modalities of how people access it are, are the solar system around it. And I think it's that kind of philosophy that allows us to really transform and, and innovate at the times. And I'll say, I think it's the modality change that um, has forced all of us to be in, in dramatic disruption and transition, but the thing in the world that hasn't changed is this basic, you know, sort of intelligent person's need and desire to make sense of the world. And, and I think that's where the times fits in. We have to really be aggressive at changing the modalities, but make sure we're still living up to that, helping <coughs> intelligent, helping all people um, make better sense of, of the world around them. And I'll just, a quick comment on the three kind of primary modalities that we operate in, in the advertising business and in the journalism business, which themselves are also in kind of radical transformation. You know, it, new, I'm new to the newspaper business, and I, but I've worked in media for a long time, and I'll tell you, I've never worked on a product that I'm more certain is utterly unlike anything else out there. And that's, you know, how, and that's because so much of the rest of the newspaper business has changed so dramatically, but what, the way the Times kind of accumulates an audience of influential people every day is still pretty extraordinary, and it, particularly on Sundays, the breadth of what you get for, you know, a handful of dollars is, is pretty extraordinary. So how we figure out how to keep doing that um, as, as the economics change is, is very important. On the desktop, you know, I, we say internally all the time, it took 150 years for the newspaper business to begin to contract. I think everyone who runs a media company now is seeing that on the desktop, and that is, you know, Times runs a huge digital advertising business and a, a very, very good one, but as mobile and social and whatever comes next become um, the major modalities that um, really looks like a business in transition. And the last comment on mobile, um, on a big news day, as much as and sometimes more than half of all of our traffic comes to us from people on a mobile device. Um, and obviously, we are not yet monetizing that at, at half of our revenue. I don't think anybody is. Um, and so that is a really, really important thing for us to get right fast. And if nothing else, we are experimenting very aggressively. So last week, we actually launched the first of what will be three new mobile news products this, uh, this year. This one is called NYT Now, and it's, it's 
primarily an iPhone product uh, to start, and it's um, essentially a news briefing product where you're getting a scannable summary of our most important stories and what our editors deem are the most important stories from elsewhere. And that's sort of a, a look at how we get into change knowing that mobile is such a dramatic force. So, so that's, that's how I would open. Um, I'm going to start on the questioning. Um, and I, I will um, go back to Linus and the security blanket and, and say, you know, for all of us, having the right sort of tools to take into great change, the blanket or whatever it is, really matters. And Nadine made this really interesting decision at this moment in her life when she's incredibly busy um, to go back and get a graduate degree. And it's not an MBA. And, and I think that speaks a lot to change. So I'd love you to talk about how you made that decision and what you're actually doing. Yeah, sure. So um, it started actually before I went client side. Um, I was at the agency and we started to do things differently. So uh, very much speaking to everything we were talking about this morning, we went from just doing spots and dots to creating brand experiences. The clients were challenging us, you know, we don't want a traditional media buying agency, we want big bold ideas. And uh, they were asking the planners, the media planners to do it. It wasn't, you know, quote unquote, the creative agency. So, and we did, we delivered many great um, brand experiences through multi-channel platform ideas. Uh, the media people had a lot of potential. There were sort of three types of media people within the team in this transitionary time. There were media people that, like me, that were so excited that media has finally had a seat at the table in a creative way and just sort of ran <coughs> for it. There was um, the middle ground that said, oh, I'm not really sure, but you're excited, so I'll go with you. And then there was the hear no evil, see no evil, you know, speak no evil. This isn't what I'm used to. I'm not comfortable doing this, et cetera, and I'm not going. So um, it got me thinking about whose right it is to think creatively, um, and it's really all of our right, and I really feel that. I think that there were a lot of great ideas that came out of the media um, agencies, and it's not anyone's right to own creative. We all deserve to sort of mm. harness our creative ability. At the same time, I started going to a bunch of different kind of conferences, and I um, became aware of a program. It's a one-of-a-kind program, as I know, of, know right now. Um, it's the only Masters of Science in Organizational Creativity and Change Leadership. It's an international program. And I decided I was going to stay on the agency side and go for my master's. And then, of course, you know, the world had other plans, and I got the call about this client job. So I deferred my enrollment, but I let Colgate know that I was going to do this, and they supported me in this, in this effort. So I graduate next month. That's awesome. Um, and the program's all about um, tools and techniques about helping the several tons of different kinds of creative thinking models out there, um, and just getting everyone to harness their own potential to drive creative thinking, to drive change leadership, um, in organizations. So it's been a very crazy, hectic experience, but I'm almost done. <laughs> so, uh, awesome. and I'm glad I did it. It's awesome. I love the idea that creative is sort of everyone's job and not just the job of, of creative people. So if there's one like takeaway lesson from school that you've learned so far, what would it be? Yeah, I learned a lot of things. Um, you know, joking but not joking aside, I learned that I will never be a true academic because going back <laughs> and doing research papers is not my thing at all. Uh -huh. uh, we, we quickly unlearn that when we get into business and to have to do that again is for me torturous. But, um, uh, but I, I have uh, learned an appreciation for how different people approach a problem. Yeah. I've also learned that sometimes the problem is not the problem we think it is and that we really need to dig deeper and clarify uh, where we're going and what it is we're truly trying to solve for. Um, whether it's for a brand or for a business or for the agency, because that will take you to different places. Um, so it's been, it's been great. I love it. I love the notion that the problem is not the problem we think it is. Yes, that's very true. So I'm going to go back to you now. Are you ready? Um, so I am. you talked about working at a 163-year-old company. I can't believe the Times is that old. Um, makes, us, makes me feel young. Uh, but in many ways, that company has st set the standard for journalism. I mean, it is, God, what else was around 163 years ago? But also, you have to deal with cost, culture, constraints of a legacy business, right? Because you've got this established organization that still has to run kind of like a machine. So how do you stay relevant and competitive 
while still feeding that big machine? Um, it's interesting. It's interesting you ask about the cost piece. So I, you know, I say to everybody, and this is you know obvious, right? There, there are more people reading the New York Times today than at any other point in our history. Obvious because of all the the ways that they can. What's maybe a little bit less obvious, and it goes to your your cost question, um, because to do what the Times does is an expensive endeavor. There are more people actually paying for the New York Times today than at any other point in our history. And that is against a backdrop of a notion of a world that will only engage with media if it is free. So two and a half years ago, there were some very brave people at the Times who said, this content is so important and so good that consumers will, in fact, pay for it digitally or on a mobile device. And we went from you know, zero to almost 800,000 people who pay for a digital subscription. I think that that really matters. I also think, like, so, so that gets to, you know, that's been a huge improvement to the business model, and we're obviously launching new paid products, particularly for mobile world. I think that the bigger question is, you know, how do we stay relevant, right? I, yeah. I think we've proven we are relevant with that, um, the, the number of people who pay and how they engage. How do we stay relevant? I think there are three things that the Times does kind of singularly well in combination. Um, <laughs> lots of companies do one or two of them well. I think the Times does all three well in combination. One, in a, um, you know, in a digital world where you can get content from anywhere, we're a beacon of truth, and we, we are that because we have as many people in our newsroom today as we did before, and as many bureaus today as we had before the economic downturn. Um, so, so we do truth really well in a way that requires enormous resources. I think we also are kind of a, a, in a stream-based world, I think you need, um, the world needs some arbiters of, of consequence. You know, what stories matter? What, what's the relative importance yep. of stories? And I think the Times still does that very well. We are so deliberate about what goes onto that homepage all day long and the, the story choices we make often surface things that, that wouldn't otherwise be on, on the world's agenda. And then the third piece of it, and I think the most, one of the um, very important pieces in a, in a digital mobile world is that we do immersive storytelling really well with multimedia. So, you know, we did Snowfall two years ago and that kind of changed. This was an incredible multimedia story with parallax imagery and video and it changed the way people thought about storytelling and you know that started as one story we now have more than 50 people in our newsroom who figure out how do we use data science and video and incredible graphics to enrich stories okay can you elaborate more on that how storytelling has sort of changed with mobile yeah. mobile and social look i think i think the basic function of the journalism again i don't think that has changed yeah. but um, i do think that the definition of what a story is, is has kind of expanded. So it used to be that a story was something that had like a beginning, a middle, and an end. And now we can do a major infographic where everybody experiences it differently. Um, I think that in a digital world, stories can be, in some cases, even at the time, certain stories can be conversations where the readers are contributors. So um, we did this incredible a uh, story called Paying Till It Hurts about the cost of medical procedures all over the country. And every single piece of data, 6,000 data points were sourced from, from readers to tell that story. Um, and then the most, one of the most famous things we did this past year, um, I, I think stories are now can be personal. We can take big topics and make them personal. So we did something this past year called the dialect quiz. Did anybody take that? Does anybody remember that? Um, good number of hands. So what it was was a 25-question survey about the words you use for certain things built on this very sophisticated Harvard linguistic study that said, you know, what do you call the rubber-soled shoe you play sports in, sneaker, seven other choices, and by that could place you on a map where you're from. It was remarkable for a couple of reasons. Um, it was the most viewed story uh, all year and in the history of the Times. Um, it was right most of the time, so like nine out of ten people who took it, seem, you know, anecdotally, seemed to get them right, and it was written by an intern. So, um, who we've since hired and is now working on a very important project for us. But so, what a story can be has yep. changed. Yeah, good. So, so tell us. Um, I think everything I just said has big implications for 
how media company, how, how um, agencies, marketers, media companies all work together. You tell us as someone who represents an enormous client, what do you want today from your agency that's different from what you wanted before? Yeah, I think, it, well, for me, it, it virtually sort of sits on the same kind of uh, key objectives. You know, it's about relevancy first. You know, we want to, I was listening to a lot of the panels this morning, and I think sometimes technology gets us, moves us faster than maybe um, the end result or the end game is. I would, I, my wish is that um, agencies and media partners come to us with relevant opportunities that are based on our real world business challenges so that we can drive and grow together. So um, if you, and this has been the way for I think a long time, because I remember even being on the agency side and some uh, multimedia aid, uh, companies coming to me for, on behalf of some of my clients' businesses trying to, well, I would give them sort of, here's the brief, this is the brand objectives, right. and then they would tell me what they were trying to sell. You know, there's a disconnect there. Um, it's, tell, you know, listen to me, bring me thought leadership, give me ideas and programs that are relevant to my business, and then you will enjoy revenue, and I'll hopefully get this, the business results that I'm looking for. So I think we're looking for strategic leadership, definitely a collaboration. I think the one unfair thing that goes on between, um, the different sides of the, of the world we live in is there's a certain amount of expectation that there are experts out there in these new worlds that we're living in. And the truth is, you know, if someone has five years of social media uh, experience, does that make them <laughs> an expert? Or do they just have five years to dedicate to social media? So I think it, we have to sort of be honest <coughs> in the fact that right. we're learning together. And then certainly someone that has, I'm, I'm picking on social media, I don't mean to, but it could be anything, pick anything, mobile. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have all the strategic know-how and the analytics and the insights background that they need to drive something forward. So I think we all need to collaborate more and work on it together. Um, but it can't start from, and unfortunately the models on, the, on the, both the agency and the media partners, um, media companies start with the revenue model. It needs yeah. to sort of start with, don't build something and then try to sell it to me. Build something I want and then I'll buy it. You know, it's kind of simple, but it's true. I, I love that notion, build something I want and then I'll buy it. And I actually think, I think that is, um, that's what media companies have to be doing now. I mean, we, we talk about the times as, you know, we used to be in the business of kind of moving the assets of a, a must buy in a, in a um, way that was pleasing and useful to marketers and now we're in the business of solving marketer problems and to your point I think one of the big things that we've had to crack into is marketers right. want to do their own storytelling on our platform so you know it used to be that we earned the vast majority of our revenue from selling the audience and the context and I think now right. native advertising with branded content we're also earning and arguably earning more value and the marketer is getting more value from, um, from being able to tell their story using our tool set on our platform. Right, so, so you're talking about native ads, right? So do you think that's a fad or do you think that's gonna keep going? Do you think consumers are just gonna get, because after a while I would think consumers are smart and they know yeah. what we're doing from a brand standpoint. Yeah. Is it gonna be too much? Is it gonna kind of be? So, and I think the last panel started, Janet started to get into this a little bit. Um, I do not think native is a fad. I think um, four years ago, three years ago, um, that was a, a worthy discussion. I actually think in a, in a stream-based world, in a mobile world, in a smartphone world, um, it may be the only way that, um, that a marketer's content can be discovered and engaged with is if it's presented um, and made participatory and discoverable the same way editorial content is. I do think that for in the case of the Times doing native or anybody like that doing native, it's gotta be unambiguously disclosed as such, but that the real issue I think is media companies now have an opportunity with native to help marketers add value to the conversations that are already happening on their platforms. And we've, Times now has seven or eight native partners. I think six right. of them are live on the site. One of the best things we've done in native advertising so far is we created um, this incredible multi-chapter infographic for Goldman Sachs 
called an interactive guide to the capital markets that literally explained in really cool data visualizations how the capital markets work and why they matter. And it had unbelievable engagement and unbelievable <laughs> social reach because it was a valuable piece of content. Right. And right. it was clearly unambiguously labeled as this was for Goldman Sachs. Our newsroom didn't touch it. They do not touch mm -hmm. anything we do in the branded content space. Our content studio on the business side built it with Goldman but it worked beautifully. And right. I think that might it was be relevant. the future of advertising. Right, consumers will, I guess, deal with it yeah. if it's relevant and they're getting value. So it's the same premise right. as That's it right. was before. So I'm gonna ask you the final question because I see Audrey sitting here, which is um, you kind of come to this audience with an extraordinary set of experiences, as Audrey outlined, having worked on the client side, having worked for many, many years on the agency side, now getting this degree. It's an awesome degree in creativity and change. If you had one thing you sort of wanted to leave everybody with, one right. idea or thought, what would it be? Do we have time, I, Audrey, for the video? Okay, so we're so just I'm, gonna roll the video. Well, just hold on one second. Yeah. I have, so I brought a case study. We actually use it in training. Um, it's from Can Media Alliance, so we didn't create it. Um, but I thought it was a great example. It's not the likely suspects, it's not a Coke, it's not, it's, but it's a brand that was able to really make a difference on their business by doing things differently, by responding um, in real time to what their um, consumer audience, how they were behaving with the messaging and the idea, and it was relevant and it had results. So it's, <laughs> it's a very interesting case study. So with that, you can play the video. The most beautiful words are often spoken when someone has passed away. Such a shame because the person they talk about can no longer hear them. For the funeral insurance company <laughs> Daler, we came up with an idea. Why wait until it's too late? Say something wonderful today. <laughs> we gave people the opportunity to say something wonderful to someone they really care about, and they were completely taken by surprise. We filmed speeches with hidden cameras and created some extraordinary commercials with real people, no actors, honest and sincere. Ik wil graag iets opdragen aan mijn uh, lieve ouders die hier zitten. Bedankt mama en pap dat jullie je leven in Iran hebben achtergelaten voor mij. Om mij een leven te kunnen bieden waar ik altijd van heb gedroomd. En waarvan ik nooit had gedacht dat het werkelijkheid zou worden. Ik wil jullie heel erg bedanken voor jullie moed en jullie doorzettingsvermogen. En voor alles wat jullie voor mij hebben gedaan. Waar ik wil je bedanken voor de mooie jaren hier. En dat niet alleen. Ik ben nu een aantal maanden getrouwd en je hebt mij enorm geholpen met klussen. Eigenlijk sta je altijd voor me klaar. Pa, ik zeg het niet vaak, maar ik hou van je. Je bent een super zoon in moeilijke tijden en in gewone tijden. Dank je wel, lieve jongen. Then we gave everyone in Holland the chance to show their love and affection. We made ads with just the word dear. You were invited to fill in the rest yourself. The people of the Netherlands made immense use of this opportunity and uploaded their beautiful words to our special website. You could also share your words via the website or via Facebook. But we went further. From the written ads, we made posters for outdoor. Each poster was unique and was displayed in the area where the person it was meant for lived. And we went even further. On New Year's Eve, we gave people the chance to express their love live on TV. A wave of beautiful words swept over Holland and we got the message across. It was picked up, talked about and acted on. And the result? Daler captured a place in the list of top 10 best known brands in Holland and the amount of insured capital grew by 50%. But the best result is that Holland grew a bit more beautiful. Okay. Why wait until it's too late? Say something wonderful today. Daler for each other. So I love this case study because I like to say, if funeral insurance can do this across multi-platforms <laughs> and create a brand experience that takes a subject that nobody really wants to talk about, death, and actually have great business results, then every, each and every one of us can be able, should be able to do something like this. It's possible. You just have to be able to think it and believe that it can be done and then create it. So I'm going to ask you the same question now. Um, what would you like to leave the audience with? So um, we have gone through a lot of change in advertising at the time since I got there, and 
We have, we, we opened one of our most important sort of moments of change discussion together as a team with that famous quote, I think it's from Darwin about change, that it's, it's not the strongest species who survive or the most intelligent, but those who are most adaptive Excellent. to change. I agree. Thank you. All right. Thank you.